warning, I do not recommend this episode if you don't enjoy jokes like these. I tried something very stupid. I, uh, I was flying to Montreal to work at the comedy festival there, and just to play a practical joke, you know, because you have to go through customs, I checked the bag filled with dog bones, because I know they have the dogs waiting in the luggage area. <laughs> and, uh, so I go to get the luggage, and you know, there's the carousel with my luggage on, and the dog's going, <laughs> two dogs wanted to fuck my bag. I mean, they were, <laughs> I go, is this bag yours? Yeah, could you open it, please? And I open it, and the guy said, what's that? And I said, dog bones. Could you come into this other room, please? You'd be surprised how far up your ass they can really go to look for stuff. And you really find out what they mean by the long arm of the law. I'm not bullshitting. We'll be done in a second. Yeah, could you scratch the roof of my mouth for me? Because I have a little itch here. I got dog bones, I got dogs. I got two dogs, I got a pregnant dog. I have a golden retriever, we have two of them. Oh, you have a golden retriever? Yeah, great. <laughs> Small world. So, uh, the dogs are mating and I didn't know. My little girl, I have a six year old, she comes in and goes, Daddy, the dogs are stuck together. <laughs> Go to your room. So I go, wow, the dogs are humping. So first, the first thing I do is I wanna make sure I got you know, a fresh battery in the video camera. And uh, I go outside and they're not humping. They're stuck together, ass to ass. And they're looking at me like, help. Are you gonna do something about this? So my neighbor comes over and he goes, wow, if they're stuck together ass to ass, that means they're definitely pregnant that, you know. So I never had puppies before. So a few weeks later, I called the vet at PetSmart and I said, how do I know if my dog's pregnant? And the guy goes, are her nipples sensitive? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Cause last night when I was sucking them, she bit me. And the guy hung up on me. Then I call another vet and the vet goes, well, it takes about, you know, 62 to 65 days before you have the puppies. Do you, do you remember what day they did it? Yeah, dear diary. Today my dog got laid. This vet said, you gotta start taking a rectal temperature every day. And I said, yeah, right. Here's where you start earning your money. I'm never sticking a thermometer up my dog's ass ever again. I, uh... Because they don't like it. They, you know, they really don't. And they don't know you're taking their temperature. All she knows is, great, he's sticking something up my ass. And they don't stand still for it. So, you know, you can't hold them with one hand and stick the thermometer in. You gotta really hold them with two hands. So I get some rubber bands and I attach the thermometer to my dick. And... Well, what else can I put it on? You know, and it's... No, no, no. The, the dick wasn't in there. I stopped at the end of the thermometer. I can't believe it. People get the wrong idea. They really do. I... My wife walks in and she goes, she goes, Bob, what's going on? I said, I think the dog's pregnant. She goes, yeah, keep fucking her. Just better hope they don't come out with your facial features. Robert Schimmel was what many comics refer to as a comedian's comedian. He was admired for his skill and consistently high-quality material, even if most of his act was X-rated and scatological in nature. Unlike other comics who performed transgressive material, Schimmel himself did not come across as lowbrow. He was a classy guy who didn't consider himself above bits about ejaculation and flatulence. According to his closest friends, he was also a very decent human being, kind, courteous, and supportive. This episode details his life and career. My history as a Robert Schimmel fan can be traced back to the summer of 1992. He appeared on a Saturday night program entitled Comic Strip Live. Though he didn't use profanity, as it was network television, his material was still transgressive, 
These are the first Robert Schimmel jokes I remember hearing. So I saw a Tampax ad. They had a Tampax in a wine glass, open like a flower, and it says, what does this tell you? That I'm never having wine at your house. I feel bad for women, I really do. You're constantly bombarded with these stupid commercials. They make women look so dumb. Susie, how could you work eight hours a day and look so young and fresh and vibrant? Stay free maxi pads. Uh, did you hear the question I just asked you? What the fuck are you thinking about? And that Summer's Eve herbal douche, do you tell your lover you use this stuff or you just surprise him and let him get there and go? Pine? Gee, how natural. Now I know what it's like to go down on my dresser drawer. <laughs> what can you say? Honey, you weren't sliding down the banister again, were you? <laughs> they have this stuff, Summer's Eve, water and vinegar with mesquite. <laughs> hey, honey, we fucking are barbecuing. <laughs> The one with the mother and daughter walking along the beach. Ma, what's feminine hygiene spray? I don't know. Ask the pelicans that are following me. I was passionate about stand-up comedy, and I would record every performance on that show, whether I had even heard of the comic or not. If I didn't like the comic, I taped over them and recorded the next one. I kept my recording of Robert Schimmel and watched it over and over and over. I watched it until that VHS tape couldn't take the abuse anymore and fell apart. Schimmel didn't get to perform on many late night talk shows because of his racy material, so I didn't see him on television again for a long time. The next Robert Schimmel performance I enjoyed was not on television. I bought his first album entitled Comes Clean for my best friend Jerry at Christmas in 1997. Jerry had some other friends over, and we all listened to that album together. Is Robert Schimmel funny? He was voted one of Comedy Central's 100 Funniest Comics. Is Comes Clean funny? Here are some quotes from his colleagues on the material and the comic himself, as printed in the liner notes. Rodney Dangerfield. You'll have plenty of laughs. Truly a funny guy. George Carlin. Robert Schimmel is a master comic, period. Buy this CD. Steve Martin. I really love this album, especially the filthy and disgusting parts. Keenan Ivory Wayans. Robert Schimmel is brilliant, and he has more hair than me. Stephen Wright. Absolutely hilarious. Al Cooper. Acerbic, tart, insightful, foul-mouthed, yet refreshing with a hint of lime. Penn Gillette. He made me laugh off two body parts that can't be printed here, but are prominently featured on this CD. Dr. Katz, Schimmel's urologist. Robert Schimmel is a very sick individual. You can take their words to the bank. The album's jokes are definitely not appropriate for children, even if many of the jokes were juvenile in the best possible way. By the time the scatological jokes brought us to the album's conclusion, we were all howling with laughter. There were probably no more than five of us in that living room, but it was like we were transported to a comedy club. We were laughing along with the crowd in the recording. Like them, we were initiated into what one comic referred to as the full-body shimmel experience. By full body, he refers to the belly laugh and other involuntary reactions that occur when you hear something truly hilarious. Comes Clean is the magnum opus of Robert Schimmel's career, his dark side of the moon, his Sgt. Pepper. The difference is not only is Comes Clean not a music album, but it could not be played on terrestrial radio. Though the nature of his material limited his exposure in mainstream media, it was no secret in the comedy world that he was much funnier than many of the clean comics who were performed on late-night talk shows and on cruise ships. After being rejected by most radio and television shows, he was embraced by Howard Stern, and he became a frequent guest. 
How did it all start? Why did it start? Who is Robert Schimmel exactly? Where did he come from? And where did he get the nerve? Well, let's focus on his life for the moment. Robert George Schimmel, known to his closest associates as Bob, was born in the Bronx on the 16th of January, 1950. His parents, Betty and Otto, were Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. Robert's only distinction as a high school student was hardly surprising. He was voted class clown. He served in the United States Air Force for one year, active during the Vietnam War. After being discharged from the Air Force, he eventually married and settled in Scottsdale, Arizona. He tells the story of how he went from managing a stereo store to becoming a stand-up comic. It's amazing to, to be in this, you know, I love making people laugh ever since I was a kid. I didn't know I was going to be a comic. I don't know if you know, but you know, I got into this business totally by, tricked into it, basically. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, I was married already to my first wife, living in Scottsdale, Arizona. I grew up in New York. I had Jessica, my, da my daughter, who was on Stern last week. And I was managing a high-end stereo video store in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's called Jerry's Audio. And, uh, and it was great. I was having a great life. We had a, we had a brand new house we lived in. And I came to visit my sister in LA. And on Saturday night, she said, uh, and it was just me. My wife and daughter didn't come. I just came to see my sister. And Saturday night, she took me to the improv on Melrose. And I'd never been to, I, even though I watch comics all the time on TV, I never, I've never been to a comedy club. I mean, this is 1980 before the boom, and there wasn't clubs everywhere. And she signs me up on this amateur thing. Hmm. And the way it works is you put someone's name, you put your name on a piece of paper, you fold it up, you put it in the waste paper basket, and Bud Friedman, the owner of the improv, actually was the MC of the show. He would stick his hand in the bucket, pull out a piece of paper, read the name, and you got two minutes on stage. And he had an egg timer on the bar stool on stage, and they would set it for two minutes. And when the timer went ding, you had to say good night. Even if you were in the middle of a joke and you couldn't get to the punchline, good night, and that's it. Well, my sister signs me up without telling me. And I'm sitting in the audience, and I'm having a beer with her, and all of a sudden, he goes, Robert Schimmel? And I'm like, what? She goes, come on, you're funny, get up there. And I said, I'm not, I can't get up there. And Bud's like, come on, don't chicken out, where are you? And the whole, he goes, don't we want him to get up here? And the crowd's, like, clapping. So I go up, and I said, you know, I'm not really a comedian, and I'm a stereo salesman, and my sister signed me up because she thinks I'm funny, and... You know, I don't know anything about show business. I could sell you, you know, speakers and this. And they started laughing. And I said, please don't laugh. And because I, I remember my first thing, I said, you know, everybody has a sexual fetish or a fantasy. And mine is to be humiliated in front of, in public, in front of a lot of people. And somebody yelled out, go fuck yourself. And I said, thank you very much. They started laughing. I got off, but came over to me and he said, sign up for spots. You can work here whenever you want. Wow. And that's all I needed to hear. That two minutes on stage hooked me right away. And I go back home, tell my wife I want to be a comedian, put the house up for sale, quit my job, pack everything up in a U-Haul. We're going to drive to L.A. We're going to crash at my sister's until we find an apartment, and I'm going to be a comedian. Well, we drive to L.A., I get off the Hollywood freeway on the Melrose exit because I want to show my wife the club that I'm going to be performing at, and it burnt down the night before we got there. And is, was this the first divorce or the second divorce? No, this is the first. <laughs> okay. And it was still smoldering. Wow. The sidewalk within the street was still wet, the windows are boarded up. It's still, there was like this smoky steam coming out of there. And Bud was out in the street talking to like insurance guys and whatever. And, uh, and my wife said, oh my God. And I said, don't worry, I'm sure they have insurance. And she said, who gives a shit about them? <laughs> she said, you sold the house and you quit your job and now the place doesn't even exist. 
And then I walked over to Bud and I said, wow, what happened? And he said, do I know you? And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> he didn't even remember who I was anymore. Wow. And that was it. So I got a day job selling stereo equipment in, in Beverly Hills. And uh, I wound up, <sighs> this is such a crazy wife, I, I wound up selling a stereo to Steve Martin. And I go to his house to install it. And I'm in Steve Martin's house, and I'm on my on my hands and knees. I'm laying speaker wire, you know, running it under the rug from the living room into the den and this other room. And he's there. He's home while I'm doing it. And he comes into the room because I was working at the stereo store in the daytime and then getting on stage on amateur nights at the comedy store and the Laugh Factory and Osco's Disco and any place where they had a comedy night. And I said, you know, I'm a comedian, too. And Steve said, yeah. That's why you're installing my stereo system. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, God, I sound like Rupert Pupkin. So um, I wind up getting discovered by William McCune, and he's the guy that discovers Steve Martin. Right, so if you look at all Steve Martin's albums, they say William E. McCune presents right. Steve Martin. That's what it says on mine. Um, William E. McCune presents Robert Schimmel. Well, Robert, on, my, I, I, on, my, I on my second CD, Steve Martin wrote the liner notes. Schimmel has stated on record that Lenny Bruce influenced him more than any other comedian. He included a tribute to Bruce as part of the enhanced CD of Comes Clean. Schimmel had six children. He lost his son Derek to cancer. Derek was 11 years old. Health problems would plague Schimmel for years, starting in 1998 when he had a heart attack. He adapted this experience into a comedy routine included on his second album, if you buy this CD, I can get this car. So I had a mild heart attack like seven weeks ago. I was in the hospital. It's a true story. I, uh, I was watching TV with my wife, and all of a sudden I had really bad pains in my chest, and it felt like a vice was closing and shooting down my arm. My fingers are getting numb, you know, and my jaw. And my wife calls the hospital, and they said, dial 911. And I said, don't dial 911. Get me there, because I know my wife, she'll call 911 and leave me laying on the floor while she's straightening up so the paramedics don't think we live like slobs. <laughs> So we go to the emergency room, they take you right in. There's no paperwork when you're having a heart attack. So remember that. If you ever have to go to the emergency room, go, it feels like there's an elephant sitting on my chest. Then they take you right in and go, that went away, but this finger hurts. Because then they can't, yeah, Because <laughs> they're not allowed to kick you out once they have you back there. So I'm laying on the table, my wife's in there, she's really scared, I'm scared too. I mean, I, I thought this is it. They're shaving my chest in case I have to get like an emergency bypass and they're giving me nitroglycerin and I'm laying on the thing and, and I'm really scared. I mean, they said, we think you're having a heart attack right now. And I ran out of shit already on the way to the hospital. <laughs> Just air was coming out, but enough that I was a human hovercraft. I, was, I wasn't actually touching the stretcher, I was hovering on my own on the silent cry that was coming out of my asshole. And I said, I don't want to die. And the guy goes, who does? I said, what? He goes, yeah, isn't that something? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. I said, well, not tonight I don't. Do you smoke? No. He goes, you're doing a little... I said, what, touching my nose? Oh, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, I'm doing a little, uh, I don't know. What? Little Tudorutsky? I said, what's that, Polish Coke? What a Tudorutsky. <laughs> I'm in there, so, and my wife's there crying. She goes, oh, honey. And I'm going, Vicky, if I die, I'm sorry for every bad thing I ever did. And she goes, well, what if you don't die? I said, what? She goes, well, are you still sorry? Or are you only sorry if you, are you going to fuck with me now? My blood pressure was like 200 over 175. And then the doctor goes, we're gonna admit you and you're gonna be in cardiac intensive care. I'm not making this up and I'm in there. And my nurse comes in, this psycho prick, this guy. He has like a red goatee but blonde hair. And he goes, you know, some guys have this thing called sudden heart death where you don't have any heart disease or high blood pressure or anything. You just, all of a sudden your heart stops and you just drop dead. You're dead before you hit the floor. He said, that's the way you really wanna go. He said, not like you, he said, because now you, you, know, you hung out a little bit and you're going to be afraid, you got a lot of paperwork and tests to take and every time you get a cramp, you're going to be afraid it's going to be the big kahuna. The big kahuna? Who's my cardiologist? Don Ho, the big kahuna. He said, I'll take a big Kahlua, that's what I want, shut the fuck up, I'm freaking out here. 
So then I have to go for the stress test, and they put you on this, this treadmill that's uh, designed to give you a heart attack in six minutes. And it starts getting faster and faster and keeps going up and up until you reach the target range they think you should be. They don't even know me. I don't do a fucking thing. I mean, I really don't. If I could will myself to the kitchen, I would. I wouldn't walk. Now, all of a sudden, I'm running up Mount Everest. I mean, I'm like, I'm like ah. and they're going, you're doing good, Bob. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. He almost made it. The next morning, I have to get an angiogram, and they shave your crotch, or maybe I just fell for it, but they... Uh, they shave your crotch. They do. They have two girls and a guy in there, and the guy's the one shaving me while the girls are giggling. So, uh... And then I have to get a shot, because they go in your thigh. They stick a th tube up your thigh into your heart, and, you know, they said, we're going to give you a shot to numb you up. You know, like when you're at the dentist. I said, you know, when I'm at the dentist, I don't get a shot in my groin. I don't know what dentist you're going to. And I don't want to go under, because you know they look at your dick right away. That's what they do. I know. Trust me. Are you, as soon as you go in for surgery, the first thing they do is, is he out? Yep. Look at the dick. And then they look at the dick. They start laughing. You get those subconscious negative messages. I got a small dick. Look at how small his dick is. I, don't know. I had a weird dream that I have a small dick. And they're going, oh, <laughs> They call friends that work in the hospital. Come down and look at this guy's dick. So, so I'm laying there. You're awake. They don't put you out when you get the angiogram. And they said, could you sign this paper that says, just in case we have to blow the balloon up, I'm already... Do you have a pan I can shit in right now? So, so then they said, here, they give me uh, nitroglycerin pills, which I have to carry on me. So I got them right here, these little... Just in case, they said, you put one under your tongue, and you know. But they don't explode when you throw them. All my friends go, let's throw one and see what happens. Yeah, here's what'll happen. I'll be short one pill when I really need it. That's what's going to happen. My wife's going to go, there aren't any more. Ah! And then I have an, you know, I'm afraid to have sex, because you're afraid to have sex. After you're in there, you know, you don't want to do anything. You know, I'm like walking real slow, and I said, you know, can you do it? And, you know, I don't know if we can jack off. You know, maybe, you know, I can't call the doctor. Is it okay to resume masturbating? I never asked him if I could start in the first place. <laughs> and I'm afraid to jack off now, because I used to love it. I mean, I love jacking off more than anything in the whole world. I mean, I really, I love jacking off so much, I wanted to have one of my balls removed and had a lotion dispenser put in. And, <laughs> But they don't really do that at Kaiser Permanente. So, uh, yeah, I was wondering if I could have a lotion dispenser put in my groin. Yeah, could you hold on a second? Security. No, because now I got to have the nitro wherever I go, and I'm, a, I'm all over the road. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm all over the country. I'm traveling all over the place. I'm, you know, and I get horny, and you're on the road. And now I'm thinking, I don't want to be in some hotel room somewhere, like in Minneapolis, and, you know, and all of a sudden I want to jack off, and I have, like, the hand cream in one hand and the nitro bottle in the other. And, you know, and then all of a sudden you get a cramp, and you, like, put the lotion under your tongue, and you drop the fucking pills. Just when you're ready to come. And then when you bend over to get the pills, it's like, ah! And your heart stops like a half a heartbeat away from coming. It's like, yeah, ooh. And then the paramedics come, they punch you in the chest, you come on their face. Because the semen's already in your dick, so it's like, pew, bang! They're never gonna revive you after something like that. Because if they revive you, then there's some kind of fag thing happening, you know? But if you're dead, then it's just ghost jizz, you know? They don't have to really worry about it. So. Tell the story to the outer limits or something. Ghost jizz. So then I get out of the hospital and they give me nitroglycerin pills and they give me a brochure, which I have with me because I, you gotta see this, I never take this on stage. It's Sex and Your Heart Attack from the American Heart Association. Yes. <laughs> and it is so great. Yeah, it's real funny lady. It's, uh, it's hysterical. Your nurse or doctor can help you discuss your sexual preferences and alternatives. <laughs> sexual preferences? Yeah, Doc, you know, I, th I like to fuck girls that are dressed like Santa Claus. <laughs> you think they really want to hear that? 
I like to jack off. I like to fill the sink halfway with water and then lift out the stopper, put my balls in and turn the garbage disposal on right before I come and see if I can shoot before the balls go down the drain. <laughs> Who are you calling? Okay, that's not in the brochure. Uh, but this is. Masturbation helps some people regain self-confidence. If that was true, I'd be more famous than Anthony Robbins. <laughs> helps regain self-confidence. Honey, I'm feeling a little insecure. I'll be in the bathroom for about 15 minutes. <laughs> Masturbation may help ease the transition to intercourse. It causes less cardiac response and takes less of the body's metabolic energy. Oral genital sex places no undue stress on the heart, but anal intercourse may lead to irregular heart rhythms. I get irregular heart rhythms just thinking about it. Now let me tell you something, if you're lucky enough to survive a heart attack, you've gotta be out of your fucking mind to take it up the ass. I just, you really do. To get out of the hospital and go, I want it up the ass now, nothing's gonna kill me. If you really think you're that lucky, What if you experience symptoms during sex? That's a real dilemma, huh? Uh, uh, oh! Oh! What, are you gonna race the heart attack? I, I can come before I die, I can... Uh, what are you, fucking stop! What do you need these people to tell you? What do I do if I'm having a heart attack while I'm fucking? Angina symptoms that show the heart can't handle the workload. Workload? <laughs> Who are you fucking, Roseanne Barr? Uh, oh, okay, sorry, Mike Tyson. So, uh, there you go. Stop having sex immediately if you have a feeling of pressure, pain, or discomfort in the jaw. That's nice. Well, what if you're 69ing? I mean, then what is it? Honey, could you get your pussy off my face and dial 911? <laughs> she goes, yeah, what a coincidence. You come and now all of a sudden you're having a heart attack. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. It's four nights in a row with the 911. First I come, then 911. The quicker you lick, the quicker I dial. Now get that fucking mouth moving. Myths and misconceptions. Sex after a heart attack often causes sudden death. <laughs> the truth is, this rarely happens, but when it does, it usually occurs when one is cheating on their spouse. <laughs> My wife wanted to have this blown up to poster size. <laughs> Extramarital sex is probably more stressful than sex with a spouse, Often there's an unexpressed need to perform well with a new partner. Unlike your wife, where there's an express need. Don't come yet, you fucking prick. Move your fucking ass. That's the express need. Sometimes there's been a high food and alcohol intake. Sex outside of marriage usually occurs in a new place. Like another woman's vagina. I... <laughs> In a new place. No, you're gonna bring some girl home to fuck. Honey, I'm gonna be fucking Jill in our bed because the pamphlet said I can have a heart attack if I fuck her someplace new. Is it best for the heart patient to be on the bottom during sex? <laughs> studies show, studies? Hey listen, we're conducting a study. Can we watch you fuck your wife? <laughs> then, they have a glossary of terms in the back. So I'm thinking, okay, this is the American Heart Association. The glossary of terms is gonna be angina, cholesterol, angioplasty, you know, bypass, you know, heart, di heart disease. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Masturbation. 
the act of exciting the genital organs, usually to orgasm. Usually? Yeah, I'm gonna prick tease myself. But you know, it's real nice when your wife's not fucking you, and then you fucking tease yourself. Here we go. No. No. I'm not in the mood tonight. Take me home. No, I want to go home. No is no. You just want me for that. If I say no, it means no. When's our anniversary? What the fuck? Here's one I didn't know. Penis. The male organ of copulation. If you don't know what a dick is and you're having a heart attack, you got real problems. Ejaculation, the abrupt discharge of semen. <laughs> abrupt. Versus what? Okay, you two go. Hold it. You two. Uh, hold up, hold up. Where are we? Okay, we're taking numbers one through 30. I mean, what? This is an excerpt from the memoir he wrote about his experience with cancer entitled Cancer on $5 a Day, Chemotherapy Not Included. Getting the news. I am in Los Angeles. I am separated from Vicky and living with Melissa. More about her in a bit. As soon as my TV pilot is finished and I get everything straightened out, I'll settle in LA for good with Melissa. Vicky and I have had a checkered relationship. We got married, then got the marriage annulled, then got remarried, got divorced, then remarried, then on the way to divorce for the absolute final time, no turning back, no bullshit, our son Derek got sick. We stayed together for him, for our other kids, fought the good fight, lost, then drifted apart. Not uncommon when a couple loses a child. Now, unfortunately, but inevitably, it's over. The final divorce. Bottom line, we tried, but it wasn't meant to be. And now Melissa, finding her, falling in love with her, realizing that I belong with her, being more certain of that than of anything in my life, and then wham, there's a light shining on me, as if the spotlight finds me for the first time. I'm asked to do a sitcom. Me? You kidding? I'm 50, bald, and Jewish. Not exactly the demographic advertisers are trying to reel in. Who cares? It's my time. After 20 years of stand-up, America has embraced me and my raw, take-no-prisoners, balls-out comedy. I'm going to be famous. Bizarre. I go into rehearsal for the pilot. The hours are grueling. The work is intense. I feel fatigued and dazed. And then right before we are set to shoot the show, I start getting chills two, three times a night. I've got the shakes so bad that I pile on extra blankets. When I wake up, the bed is soaked, totally drenched, as if a pipe has burst beneath the sheets. Melissa is worried, begs me to see a doctor. I don't know any doctors in L.A., I call my manager, who makes an appointment for me with his doctor. I go in for a checkup, and the doctor schedules me for a CAT scan. The scan comes back clean. You're run down, the doctor says. We might want to do more tests. You could have Epstein-Barr or mono. That'd be my guess. Even though there's nothing on the scan, something eats at me. I don't know why, but I feel like there's something else. Something that the scan didn't see. After a week after we shoot the pilot, I'm playing the Monte Carlo in Vegas. My parents are staying with me. It's early June, and by noon the temperature is hitting 110 degrees. But no problem, it's a dry heat. One afternoon, my dad and I decided to take a stroll through the forum shops. Suddenly, I'm freezing. My entire body starts to shiver. My lips quiver, and my teeth begin to chatter. Robert, you're shaking. I'm freezing. I'm going to go into the Gap and buy a sweatshirt. I'm really cold. Have you seen a doctor? Yeah, I saw that guy in L.A. You have to get a second opinion. 
today. I call the doctor who removed my gallbladder a few years ago. He sets me up the next day with a doctor at Mayo in Scottsdale. The doctor wears a permanent frown as he goes over me like he's buying a used car. Finally, he says, How long have you had this lump? Lump? Where? Right here. He lifts my left arm and rubs a tiny bump in my armpit, half the size of a pea. I didn't know I had that. The doctor puckers his lips. For a second, it looks like he's going to kiss me. Then he whistles out a thin stream of air. Feels funny, he says. I want to do a biopsy. And that's how I ended up here at the Mayo Clinic. My parents sitting bedside. Nobody saying much. All of us waiting for the news. Actually, there's another curveball. When I woke up in the recovery room, after some of the anesthetic wore off, I felt pain shooting up under my right arm. Sure enough, my right arm was bandaged, not my left, the one with the petal-sized lump. When I was being wheeled into my room, I said to the orderly, You guys did the wrong arm. I could see him studying in my chart. His eyes clouded over. Let me get the doctor. I don't know how long I waited for the doctor. I was in a morphine-induced cloud. When I managed to blink my eyes open and focus, the doc was standing over me. We didn't do the wrong arm, he said, continuing the conversation I'd begun with the orderly. We found another lump under your right arm. How big? With his thumb and forefinger, the doctor made a circle the size of a quarter. Jesus. Yeah, he said. Is it? Waiting for the results, he said. His marriage to Melissa did not survive. She had an affair with their neighbor. There was an incident wherein Schimmel was accused of domestic violence and was arrested. The district attorney decided that there wasn't enough evidence to charge him and dismissed the case. Melissa soon filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. Health problems would plague Schimmel once again. He received a blood transfusion while in the Air Force and contracted hepatitis C. He developed cirrhosis of the liver to the point where he was added to a waiting list for a donated liver. I speak of him in the past tense because he lost his life on September 3, 2010, in a car accident. Unfortunately, no memorial website was constructed to honor him publicly, so this episode will have to do, I suppose. Many stand-up comedians remembered Robert Schimmel fondly. This is from an interview with Paul Rodriguez. Robert Schimmel is someone that I also have known since, uh, man, really at the beginning of the whole thing. I mean, he wrote my first HBO special. I mean, I don't know. I don't have to tell you. He did? Yeah, he when? Uh, two days ago. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know I didn't know that. Yeah, I had a car car accident a couple days prior. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was kind of my hero. I mean, uh, I mean, I knew I knew Shimmel some. My guy, we, we started together. We well, may he rest in peace. Yeah. What a life he had! I don't know so many, so many challenges, so many challenges. You know, I mean, Jesus. Here are some other quotes by his fellow comedians. Dane Cook, Robert Schimmel was one of the first people in comedy to call when my folks were fighting cancer. No ego, no BS, no small talk, just inspiration. Jim Gaffigan, rest in peace Robert Schimmel, really funny, really nice, really will be missed. Tom Green, Robert Schimmel, rest in peace. Penn Gillette. I'm so sad about Robert Schimmel dying. I've been checking the news for three hours, hoping it wasn't true. He was very funny and wonderful. Jimmy Kimmel. Robert Schimmel was one of the funniest and nicest guys in comedy. Marlon Wayans. The world lost a true comedian, one of the greats. He turned his pain into laughs. He was fearless. Rest in peace, Robert Schimmel. Jessica Schimmel, Robert Schimmel's daughter, was asked about her experience of being Robert Schimmel's daughter. Here are some quotes. He was always entertaining for me and my friends. I most certainly had the coolest dad, hands down, 
But also it was hard because he was more like a friend than a father figure. We were always equals. And he sort of scared the guys I wanted to date. Jessica recalls her father having some of his fellow comics over as guests. I remember Rodney Dangerfield the most and the Wayans brothers. But also I was told that I had a thing for Kevin Nealon and Michael Keaton. I know that Jay Leno, Michael J. Fox, and others would come over after the shows at 2 a.m., and I would always wake up, and they would let me hang out or take me to canters with them. But recently at the Aspen Comedy Festival, I think it was surreal for some of them. They couldn't believe they were partying with me. They felt old. Jessica recalls her role in Robert meeting his second wife. Well, when I was 21, my dad secretly started dating a friend of mine who was 25, Eventually, he and my mom split, and he informed us. Not long after, she got pregnant, and they got married. It was definitely strange to have him dating my friend, but as a stepmom, even stranger. I never caught on, but when I found out, it was a Mission Impossible moment when all the details flashed before me and made perfect sense. When we go places, people don't know who is the wife and who is the daughter, and they think he must be the proud grandfather of his son. She recalls how the dynamic of her friendship with Melissa changed. Well, friends first and foremost, not at all mother and daughter, although I do look to her for advice quite a lot. I actually usually call over there and ask for her to be put on the phone. Once in a while, we'll be talking and she'll forget and be talking about sex, and then I'll realize it was with my dad, and I shudder. Jessica shared her feelings about the tragedies in her life, including Robert's brush with cancer, his death, and Derek's passing. Strangely enough, I always remained really positive. When my brother died, I was sad, but knew his life and death had enriched my life, and I was grateful for the short time I had with him. Then I was diagnosed with diabetes, and my dad with cancer, and I was like, okay, enough with the life lessons. I am done learning, but I realize that as hard as things are, strangely enough, you find the strength to get through them. Of course, I've had the days when I felt like the world was falling, but somehow you make your way through. Jessica would occasionally accompany Robert when he was on tour. When I was little, the cocktail waitresses would watch me while he was on stage. I would hear the act and never understand. I remember one day finally understanding and then going... Oh my god. I hope you listen to and watch some of Robert Schimmel's comedy, if not all of it. I'm sure you will enjoy it as much as I have. I'm going to leave you with the scatological material that concludes Comes Clean. This is Morgan Rector for the Second Act Podcast. Bye for now. I just had a birthday, so I had to go to a com for a complete physical. I'm in there undressed. The guy tells me to bend over. He's putting a rubber glove on. I said, what's happening? He said, eh, it's nothing. I need a stool specimen. I said, well, how about I shit on the floor and you pick it up? <laughs> Same shit, no hand up the ass. He said, don't worry, I wear a glove. Yeah, that was my main concern, the glove. <laughs> Not the diving watch. I was wearing like a Rolex colon master. I had to get a thing called the sigmoidoscopy. They have something like this long. The guy goes, now, Robert, today we're gonna stick this up your ass. I said, why, did one of my checks bounce? <laughs> he said, no, don't be alarmed. It's just to look around. I said, yeah, for a, a parking space? Come on. So I, could, I thought this thing was a coat rack when I came in. He says, this detects blood in your colon. I said, yeah, if you use that, I can make a prediction right now. And he lay down, velcroed my arms to my sides, turns me upside down, he's feeding it in like the rotor rooter guy. I thought he was laying a phone line to Hong Kong in there. He says, you might feel a little pressure. On the roof of my mouth, get it out. <laughs> and he thinks he can talk to you while he's doing it. You know? Yeah, so what do you think of the baseball strike? I taste metal. Then I'm laying there upside down with this thing up my ass, and he goes, I gotta call somebody else in here. I said, what, what is this, something wrong? I said, no, he's just never gonna believe you let me do this to you. <laughs> I 
hate those guys. Yeah, your left testicle feels funny. Well, then leave it alone. <laughs> feels funny for me that you're holding it so long. I don't see what this has to do with my root canal anyway. I had to go to the hospital. I thought I was having an appendicitis attack. I'm in the emergency room. The doctor comes in. He said, I'm going to push on your stomach. You tell me when it hurts the most. And he pushed on this one spot, and I farted. And the pain went away. And it cost 75 bucks to fart in the emergency room. The Blue Cross doesn't cover that. And excuse me doesn't cut it with the doctor either. I don't know who thought of excuse me. How about look out before you do it? Some people don't even say, excuse me, you get to a certain age. My grandfather, hi, Bob, how you? <laughs> Jeez, Grandpa. What? What? Well, the rug tore off the floor and flew out the window. No one wants to admit the farting, even if you have one of those little baby farts, one of those... You try and make people think you made that sound with your mouth. <laughs> Like everyone around you isn't going, man, his breath smells like shit. How about when you have to fart and you want to let it out real easy so nobody knows? And you shit in your pants. It's one of those surprise farts. Hey, that's wet. And you're at work and you have to throw your underwear out. someone catches you at the dumpster. Hey, what do you got over there? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing, that's shitty underwear. It's not mine. Are you carrying somebody else's shitty underwear around? Actually, you don't have to worry about that anymore. I saw an ad for adult diapers, depends. That's something to look forward to, huh? Now you can finish that important business meeting and take a dump at the same time. And no one's the wiser with the pens. Yeah, we'll put that new building up right over here. Ooh. Hey, Joey, you okay? Yeah, I shit in my pants. I'm cool. I'm wearing a diaper. Shit twice already, you can't tell, right? Shit could be scary. I took a shit once and it was black, and I know black shit means something's wrong, and I started to panic, and I called my dad. I said, Dad, you're not gonna believe this. I just took a shit and it's black. He said, Bob, you're not gonna believe this, but I'm in a business meeting and you're on the speakerphone. 